So at this time, I would like to introduce our speaker, Stefan Graf, who is an F-I-A-L-D, um, with I and also L-C-I-E-S, lighting specialist with Illuminart. Stefan Graf uh, is F-I-A-L-D and is a, is, has a career in professional lighting practitioner and educator, providing seminars to audiences worldwide. He's recipient of over 52 International Lighting Design Awards. He's a fellow with the International Association of Lighting Designers, IALD, and has been an instructor of lighting design at Lawrence Tech, CCS, U of D, and U of M. His seminars receive high marks for the educational materials that are presented, and they're also in entertaining, and I like to always say enlightening. How's that? <laughs> His presentation is entitled, Achieving Long-Term Lighting Benefits. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Graf. Thank, Thank you for being Thanks here. Thanks very much. We'll see you Sounds later in the day, probably, huh? I'll look for you. Okay. Hello, everyone. You must be passionate about light, otherwise you wouldn't be here. I've been passionate about light all my life since I think I was four years old under the covers with a flashlight. And I realized all the cool stuff you could do with it. Anyway, um, welcome. If you haven't heard me speak before, you may be really surprised at the content of this seminar. Because it's not all about electric lighting. Um, See here. We have to show this slide. Um, so, with learning objectives. I really don't have to go through this. I, by the way, this power, this presentation is on our website, uh, illuminart.net, on the resources page. It's there's pr dozens of lighting education presentations there. This one's there. It's called the LTU sustainable lighting presentation. So you can grab a copy of this and print it out and you don't have to take notes about all this stuff. It's, you can just grab all of this later. Um, we're going to talk about lighting quality factors today and what that means to you. Uh, we want to talk about high benefit lighting solutions. The National Lighting Bureau has kind of coined that phrase. Thanks a lot. Uh, and we're going to find out what that means. Um, understand the costs of natural light integration with electric lighting and know what is involved in achieving long-term lighting goals. And a little bit about LEDs. LEDs aren't necessarily all what they're cracked up to be. So I want to start with lighting quality factors. Um, lighting systems specify to meet energy needs without equal emphasis on lighting quality does not serve the project long-term goals. Not many folks talk about lighting quality. When you talk to them, they talk about energy and savings and return on investment and things, but this is something that seems to get lost. And years ago, we had buildings filled with beautiful, wonderful, natural light. How many of you enjoy working in rooms all day long with no windows? So, and it's not about foot candles anymore. Lighting used to be all about foot candles. Well, they are taking a back seat now. Sure, they're important, but they're about one-tenth of the conversation. We have to talk about all these other things first, then you use foot candles to kind of verify some assumptions. That... Oh, yeah, OK. Oh, good. Look at there. High tech, upside down. This one here? OK, thank you very much. So light is an invisible medium. You can't see light. And I realized when I was teaching at Lawrence that I had to come up with a whole new education program because I said to the students, we're going to design lighting systems for the offices. What's the first thing they do? And they said, we're going to do a ceiling grid and do a, go to the fixture catalogs and put. And I said, well, what's it going to look like? And they said, oh, we're going to have 30 foot candles. I said, yeah, but what's it going to feel like? How, how are people going to feel that environment? So I spent 16 three hour classes teaching students how to understand and visualize patterns of light and color. That's the first step in the design process. And then you work your way back to the lamps, because the lamps provide the distribution of light and the energy efficiency. And then you select the fixtures. So the process is a little different. But lighting quality uh, begins, some of these qualities of light are color, color rendering, color temperature, 
of electric light and also of daylight. But we know that the better the color quality, the better your visibility. So if you have poor color quality lamps in a project, visibility goes down. If you inc increase the color quality, visibility goes up. Acuity, visibility, depth perception, reaction time, and all of that. Distribution of light, the uniformity, and the illuminance contrast consideration. Illuminance is projected light or measured light, okay? And we have contrast with illuminance. You can have a, a room that's all like fluorescent lighting, and it's very uniform and diffuse like a cloudy day, or you can have a, a layer of fluorescent lighting with pools of light on the color, splashes of light like on the brick over here, okay? And that contrast adds visual stimulation. How many people feel better on a sunny day versus a cloudy day? What we've learned is it's the five to one illuminance contrast ratio between sunlight and shade that makes people happy. So you ask yourself, how do you want your home or office or factory to feel? Do you want it to feel like a cloudy day or a sunny day? And is there a benefit to that? Um, we can measure light in uh, illuminance, but there's also the perceived brightness of light. The psychological perception of light. If you uplight a ceiling in an office, you can measure 10 foot candles, but it'll feel like 30. And if you do down lighting in an office without any uplighting, you can measure 30 and it could feel like 10. So the perception of brightness is an important factor to consider when you're thinking about lighting systems in a space. Luminous values, you have to, you have to go hand in hand now, the interior light reflectance values of a space are really, really, really critical in design. You can't design a lighting system anymore without discussing this with the interior design team and making sure we hold to this. Because, for example, um, is it brighter here or here? I'll guarantee you the foot candles are the same. If you want high perception of brightness, you have to design rooms and spaces and buildings with high light reflectance values. And on the back of a paint ship, you can find the LRD. Yes, do you have a question? If you don't use the mic, we can't hear you in the room. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So you have to design buildings with high light reflectance values for the uh, perception of brightness to be increased, if you want that. If you don't want high perception of brightness, then you might have used darker colors. Visual comfort and glare. Glare is the biggest enemy of good lighting practice. You take glare down and visibility goes up exponentially. Bright oncoming car headlights at night are a good example of glare. You reduce the high beams and you can see better, right? Well, glare is very subliminal and very important. It's kind of like a distorted sound system. You can hear the music when the sound's distorted, but you can maybe hear it better if there wasn't distortion and you then therefore could decrease the volume of sound and actually hear it better if the dis distortion wasn't there. So there's a lot of similarities between lighting and sound that I like to use. And movement of light um, is people like that. People like, that's why one of the benefits of sunlight is that dynamics of the, 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 the sun uh, with the light, uh, with the clouds moving in front of it and that, that, that slow move. It's kind of like a wave machine in your office, you know. It, it's, it's, people really enjoy this. One of the things we, we like. So these are, these are the lighting qualities. This is how we start thinking about lighting for a space. This is the first step. And sparkle. People like stars and candles and so maybe, maybe sparkles a consideration potentially for lighting in a space. I just want to look at one lighting, illustrate one lighting quality factor, the glare factor. Uh, interior buildings, you have highly specular surfaces that cause glare. You have excessive contrast. Windows are too bright and, 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 and uh, you got too much sunlight coming in or direct glare from sunlight or direct glare from light sources. And same thing with exterior. There's uh, source glare that's caused from high brightness light fixtures in the upper uh, right corner. But there, uh, there's a university that's lighted with no glare. You can see just as well. You can see everything actually better. 
when you don't have glare. You drive down some of these new uh, streets, uh, cities have been relighted with high glare. That's kind of, I call it the prison, prison yard effect. And you, if you reduce the glare, you can see a lot better. So this lighting quality thing has become really important. And about 15 years, well, maybe 12 years ago, on the upper uh, right is the Illuminating Engineering Society handbook. And for the first time, a bunch of independent lighting designers got together and formed a committee called the Quality of Visual Environment Committee and wrote this chapter called the QVE. Has anybody heard of this before? The QVE, the Quality of Visual Environment? Okay. And I'm par oh, uh, this is just the first uh, couple paragraphs. But it, it says that um, for the longest time, the IES developed a recommended uh, foot candles or illuminances for specific applications. And lighting specifiers often mistook this system of recommended foot candles as the primary or even sole criteria for lighting design. This addition introduces a new formal system of lighting design criteria. And if followed, it'll increase the minimum standard of care to, for lighting design. If you're an architect or an interior designer, you always want to use the highest possible standards of care in your practice. And if you're not familiar with the QVE, you should be. So it became so important that they came out with the uh, DG18, the Design Guide 18, which is a guide for designing quality lighting for people in buildings. You can obtain this from the IES website. And what this uh, illustrated for us is that lighting quality addresses the human needs, the uh, economic and environmental needs, and the architectural needs. That's what lighting quality is all about. And issues of visibility with task performance, mood, atmosphere, all of that has to be part of the conversation early when you're lighting a space, whether it's a relighting of a space or it's new construction and lighting design. You, th this is the how the conversation has to be, uh, uh, has to follow. And so we always kind of knew, uh, we've been practicing sustainable lighting for about 30 years, uh, long before it was popular. And we kind of always knew that better lighting made people happier and more product productive and so on. It's kind of like we kind of knew that eating our vegetables and exercising would make us healthier, but we, there was no evidence for that for a long time, right? Uh, so. In the last 15 or 20 years, there's been very substantial research, exhaustive research, not sponsored by lighting manufacturers, which could be biased, but by independent research groups to substantiate our ideas that this is true. And where we found that productivity gains in offices of 0.7 to as high as 26% productivity gains can be realized when you have high quality lighting in an office space. And the same thing holds, you've heard about the uh, uh, lighting for schools with test scores going up and in hospitals with patients getting out sooner and healing faster and so on, it's taking less pain medication. All of this research is available from, the, from these organizations. Uh, at the back of this seminar, all of the website links are available for this. So this sounds like a lot of exaggerated claims, but when you get deep into the research, it's pretty exciting stuff. The high benefit, retail, Walmart is a, back in late 90s, started putting skylights in their buildings, and they are totally committed to this now because the benefits for natural light in retail spaces is phenomenal, and the study showed after looking for many years uh, at thousands of square feet of retail space, that uh, sales in retail spaces uh, with daylight are 40% higher with 99% statistical certainty. That's phenomenal. Where you say, oh, I can't afford the skylights for my big box retail space or for my retail space. But when you look at the statistics of how much more sales of you, you accomplish with that, from customers coming and feeling comfortable, it's just, it's, it's amazing. So it far exceeds the energy benefits. Skylights or daylight integration will pay for itself in from two and a half to five years. If you had a five year payback from natural light in your retail space or in your office space or 
some place where the people are need light for sustainability. Uh, that's a 20% return on investment. That's a little better than the stock market, and it's guaranteed for 20 for the life of the building. So we know natural light is. There's a lot of great benefits to it, but there's a lot of issues to overcome when we talk about this. Lack of awareness. Architects, building owners, contractors, interior designers aren't aware of these benefits. Uh, so we gotta get the word out there. Uh, electric, electric lighting dominates the thinking. P people don't think much about daylight integration. At our office, that's the first thing we talk about. Integration of daylight with electric lighting and control systems. The need for fenestration fashion. On the south, east, and west elevations, we might want to have dark glass with a 20% a transmission value. It looks black from the outside, but it's used to control the sunlight. On the north elevation, the glass might be clear. Is that okay? I've had architects object to that. They want all the glass, to, they want the building to look the same, the same from all elevations. We have to start thinking about window, uh, as, uh, windows as light fixtures and harvesting that free natural energy, or that free natural light that comes through the, into the space. Construction budget is not adequate. It's not discussed early enough. Uh, lack of owner advocacy because they're just not aware of it. And false beliefs based on past experience. Skylights leak. They're too hot. There's too much thermal gain. Too, there's too much glare. All of that is not true. Okay. Skylights leak because of value engineered installation problems. Okay. So daylighting design is pretty involved and it costs a little extra money. But again, when you take a look at the return on investment compared to the, the, the initial costs, it's, it's really phenomenal. So you need support by the project owner. The building, or, if you can orientate a building on, on site with the south elevation and to design the building to capture and harness that daylight, it's phenomenal. There's lots of case studies and examples out there now uh, where you can see how this works. Glazing collection, shading systems, interior surface reflectance values, solar collector, applied sun louvers, integration of daily electric lighting control systems is a huge energy saver. I've got a slide that talks about that. Whole building energy modeling will tell you how will size your air conditioning and heating systems for the building with the daylighting design. When we've done this and, uh, on, on projects, we've, we've found that we're able to take 20 to 30 percent out of the air conditioning costs because they were initially over designed to begin with because the mechanical engineers kind of took a guess at maybe what the uh, AC cost should be. That savings alone paid for the daylighting design. Um, and uh, there's a little plug down there at the bottom. So there are new lighting methods that now have been spawned uh, based on all this new information. And so for, for the super optimum uh, lighting programs for offices, for example, it's a five-layered uh, program. You start with daylighting integration. You have lighting controls to manage the daylight and also lighting controls. People love having control over the lighting over their individual tasks. Some workers are younger and some are older. Some are doing CAD, some are working on paper tasks. Some want 50 foot candles, others want 10 or five. And if you can give everybody at their workstation in private offices or open offices controlled task lighting, not only does it cause, create improved worker satisfaction and productivity goes up, but you save a lot of energy. There's no reason to have all that task lighting, all, all you know, 30 to 50 foot candles on in an office if there's nobody at the desktops. So we start with daylighting, lighting controls, ta good, high efficient, glare free, good color task lighting, and perimeter wall lighting. One of the things that people like about w rooms with windows is not the view, they like bright, illuminated surfaces. So you have your windows over here and they're beautiful, but then you move around the space and you start lighting the walls. Back there, the walls are lit. They're bright. Up here, they're not as bright. If you had to work in this space for eight hours, would you prefer to be over there or over here? 
So it's really important. And then the ambient lighting, we used to light offices with the high ambient light systems from overhead. Now we're engineering or designing lighting from ambient lighting to be three to 15 foot candles. Not very much. But how much room do you need, or how much light do you need to walk around in the space and open a book and show somebody a drawing if you're in the middle of the aisle? You don't need that much light to do that. You can read, generally, even myself, at my age, I can read under five foot candles with no problem. So it, it's a layered approach. And when you do this, you can reduce energy by as much as 50%. You can achieve energy results 56% below uh, ASHRAE 90.1 easily. Okay. It costs a little more to do it, but it's worth it. So we look at the, the construction costs relative to the annual operation costs. Uh, Construction, design and construction is only 1%, 2% of, of the salaries and occupants over the life of the building. Maintenance and energy is maybe 10 or 20%. And then the annual building operation costs, again, salaries and uh, benefits far exceed anything else over the life of the building. Uh, so, and again, here's another chart for facility costs. And with productivity savings, if you have a 10% productivity savings of people in a, in a typical office building, and you can do this at your own office, just add up all the people, come up with a number that you pay them in salaries, divide by the square footage, and it's gonna be like two to $300 a square foot per year for the people in that space. 10% of that is about 30 bucks per year, net loss or gain. 5% is $15.90 per year, net loss or gain. If you have high quality lighting, you'll, your corporation will earn or gain $15 a per square foot per year. If not, that goes down. $15.90, that's a 5% productivity savings. You saw the, the, the information earlier from about one to 27%. If you take the average of that, it might be, what, 13% or something. But so let's say 5% increase in productivity is the cost of the entire lighting system installed in one year in productivity gains. This is a sketch I just did last week <laughs> to illustrate a high benefit lighting system for an office. So I thought I'd throw this in here. Uh, we have sunlight comes from the southeast or west elevations. Uh, the lower part, there's dark glass with automated diffuse shading. The upper part, there's clear glass with, a, with louvers to reflect light deep into the space. The ambient light levels are five to, or seven to 15 foot candles. The task lighting uh, is, uh, is gonna be a lot higher, so you can, and it has to be controlled. With the light reflectance values of the partitions is important, the light reflectance values of the desktop is important. If you have a dark desk surface with a white paper task and you're working there all day, your pupils are expanding and contracting from the extreme contrast between the white paper and the black background. It causes eye strain and fatigue and a lot of problems. Um, so. Uh, let's see, task lighting, blah. Oh, anyway, so that, that kind of illustrates the, the approach. And then a wall lighting uh, in the perimeter, and there's some hallway lighting down there. Uh, this is one product illustration I wanted to show you. There's a, uh, up on the top of this, there's a parabolic louver, and the bottom there's some shading systems that are, would be automated with a photo sensor to raise and lower. Uh, but look at the, uh, the uh, Illustration on the top right, how that sunlight projects deep into the office space. Now, at the back of this open office space, if that was a corridor and you had clear story at the top of the corridor, you could light the hallways with natural light and turn off the electric lights during the day. So architecture, lighting, design, interior design, all of this has got, it's a holistic approach to lighting now and not, it used to be separate, you know. Well, this, let the electrical engineers do some lighting uh, plan and we'll have 30 foot candles and everybody's happy. It's, it's all changing. So how much does it cost? So lighting is about three to 5% of the construction costs in, in, in new office buildings. The biggest problems we have when coming into a new project is that the architect gets some sort of uh, budget 
cost per square foot budget or some estimate on lighting, what lighting should cost from a construction manager who's using data that's 10 to 15 years old. And it doesn't take in consideration all these other things. So if we can get the involved early enough for shopping malls and houses of worship and for offices, we can provide some real numbers. Um, a basic office lighting system costs between seven and eight bucks a square foot. Good, good quality, low glare, good color, nice looking fixtures. Uh, but if you want to start providing high benefit lighting programs, you need to have a task ambient office lighting system. And that's 12 to 14 bucks a square foot. All right. Daylight harvesting with controls where you're redirecting daylight into the space. This is just not glazing and shading. This is bouncing light into the space and using that natural light. It increases the cost a little more. And if you want an optimum lighting system, it's 18 to $24 a square foot for an office on the south elevations. So the architect asked me, well, how much per square foot is this? I said, well, within 30 feet of the windows, it could be as much as $24 a square foot. Deeper into the space, it might drop down to $16 a square foot. On the private offices, it might be $12 a square foot. On the north elevation, it might be $12 a square foot because we're not, we're not going to do daylight harvest. So you, you almost have to make a map of the office plan and plug in your cost per square foot estimates based on that. It, it's just one, uh, one design doesn't fit all. And professional lighting design services to do the whole building energy modeling, daylighting analysis, get all this stuff on paper, consult with the design team, make sure it all gets done right, is a 7 to 10% of the budget is a good way to estimate that. Technologies, fluorescent, metal halide, and induction lighting, and halogen lighting is marching along just as fast as LED. But all we hear about is LEDs. All the light fair booths show LEDs. Um, so there's a lot of misunderstandings and uh, exaggerated claims about LEDs. We know all the benefits of LEDs. The marketing departments are really huge. Great commissions are being made on selling this new technology. But there's a lot of potential problems with LEDs that it's important for users and specifiers to know about. It's confusing, because a confusing definition. Is it, you're talking about the lamp or the system, because an LED Product is made up of the housing, the thermal management, the driver, the emitters, the reflectors, the optics, all of that. There's a lack of information in product details. There's start, the IAS is starting, and the Department of Energy is starting to work together to, to standardize this because the information you get from one manufacturer is different from the other. Uh, it's a big problem. Truth in advertising, creating false expectations. The reps come into our office and we love our reps and you know we can't live without them. But when they start talking about LED products and we, and then we let them get through all of that and we say, well, this isn't true and that's not true and it, it's really not equal to a thousand watt metal halide. They go, oh, yes it is. I say, no, it's not. We've already done, we've done the independent analysis of this. The Department of Energy has a program called Caliper, which is like a consumer reports for LED products. I don't have much time to talk about that, but you can go online and and learn, learn about that. Standardization of published data, maintenance and contract issue. Who's going to maintain the system 10 years down the road? How are they going to know how to maintain an LED system? Are there going to be training on this? Or is the, a contractor going to know how to do this? Color shift and light loss over time. There's a, on the bottom left, there's a picture of an LED strip, and some of them are pink and some are blue. And all. Is that acceptable? How do you prevent that? It's because these LED emitters are, are, are produced in binning, in batches. There's like thousands and thousands of emitters are produced, and then they produce another batch. It's supposed to be the same specs, but they're a little different color. So you have to be aware of that. Rapid change, uh, uh, pace of change. Every six months, they get less expensive and more efficient. So when do you jump in there? The price is starting to come down. The initial cost, it's hard, it's hard to determine the, the, the true initial cost because of all the markups from reps and distributors and 
contractors and all that. You, the, the sales rep might say, oh, this is a $400 fixture, and it gets to, gets to the job, and it's $900 because of the conventional markups by suppliers. Um, let's see, life cycle cost pay, what is the payback period? If you do an independent life cycle cost, anal or, uh, life cycle cost analysis, the data, the information you may, may receive back is much different than a supplier might give you. Uh, and the specifier's risk and liability. I've had a, I've heard about five stories that are true of specifiers who put in LED products and three to five years later, they're failing. And the owner comes back and says, you told me this was gonna last 40,000 hours, which at 10 hours a day is 10 years or 11 years. I want them all replaced. You're responsible. So we want warranties that equal the rated life of the product. If, 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 if an LED manufacturer is gonna say it's gonna last 40,000 hours, that's 10 years at 10 hours a day. I want a warranty for that. Um, we have on our website, we have a paper called LEDs, Rewards, and Risk Management, which you can grab. It's a PDF. It's on the front page, so you don't have to dig around on the website for it. But it, it talks a lot more about some of this stuff. Um, and the other news is just yesterday, we, in our office, we have this woman who's just phenomenal, and she's become our, the Southeast Michigan LED expert, and we're working on a large technical center that has offices and warehouse space. And we sent them an email and says, there is no cost benefit in new construction use by specifying or you trying to use LED products for those high ambient lighted areas over fluorescent. Fluorescent, how many knew that fluorescent lighting now has a 60,000 hour lamp on the market? A couple of people, okay. So LEDs are rated for 40 to 60,000 hours, something like that. So fluorescent systems cost a quarter as much as an LED system potentially, or maybe half as much. So in renovations, LEDs may be a good consideration, but the fluorescent is, Technology is marching along and it's a lot less expensive and it's a lot more familiar and you get super high quality light out of a fluorescent system. So how do you achieve high benefit lighting? You have to create awareness. You have to have expertise. Provide comprehensive specifications. These specification schedules that just talk generically about products, you can't manage the quality of light when you do something like that. So you have to have comprehensive performance specifications. Um, you have to manage the specs, make sure they're not value engineered by suppliers. And that booklet up on the upper right is available from the IALD, which is like the AIA for lighting designers. Uh, it's called the Guidelines for Specification Integrity. If you go to IALD.org, you can get a copy of that, and it gives you the language you need to manage lighting specifications. You need commissioning and verification that everything was installed as planned, and equally as important, you have to have training and for the maintenance and users for this to work over a long period of time. Now, this is, these five steps have become so, recognized as so critical that I was just in Madrid, uh, a year and a half ago, and there's a European Commission on Lighting, and I also know that the, the California has started, there, there's an organization called the National Advanced Lighting Controls and Applications Certification. You know how fashions, trends, and music, and all that come from Europe and California, they kind of make their way to the Midwest eventually. There is gonna be certification for lighting professionals, to, and there's gonna be manned in California and Europe that they follow these steps because they realize how important it is over the long term that lighting be done properly. So uh, on maintenance and training, uh, 15 years ago we did a Disney store. We did two things at the Disney store, it was a 35,000 square foot retail space. We put a poster in the cast member's break room. I'm still okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and the poster said, your lighting is important. It was very simple. 
and it says the lights are off near the windows because the sunlight's bright enough and we're saving energy. The lights automatically dim when you leave the room. We're saving more energy. You know, just that kind of real simple thing. And here's how to use the control systems. You know, and it was and the and the the the, uh, the staff members there when they were eating lunch or something, they go, hey, look at this. They read it, you know, and they, oh, that's why the lights are off by the windows, and that's why, that's how to use that control system. So, oh, that's, you know, so, same thing in schools and offices. If you don't teach folks and explain to them why things are working the way they do, they get excited. Walmart had this problem real early in the early days where they found maintenance people were going and cutting the wires to the photo cells because the lights were dimming when the sun was bright enough. And the customers were, some of the customers are complaining, oh, lights are dim, you know, even though they had 30 to 50 foot candles in there with sunlight. So, and they put duct tape over photo cells. And they, you know, it, so they had to train the maintenance staff and train the users of the space how the systems were operating. Uh, so it's another step in, high, in achieving high quality lighting benefits. You, you really have to inform people about uh, how this all works. Exterior lighting, um, there is a new, and it's available for free on the IES website, the Model Lighting Ordinance, the MLO. And it's prescriptive, and it was written by professional lighting designers through the Illuminating Engineering Society and the Dark Sky Association, and it really works. It, 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 it helps you it's a, to produce beautiful, glare-free, dark sky compliant lighting after dark. It's phenomenal. And it's it's uh, it, and it took seven years to put together this uh, this uh, model lighting ordinance. So again, you can read all this later, but I want as an example by following some of these ideas, we do a lot of car dealerships. Car dealerships, the design criteria for car dealerships primarily comes from the owner saying, "I want to be brighter than the next guy," or all of the manufacturers that sell car dealer lighting have these formulas on their websites of how to light car dealerships. And they're way over lit. Uh, so if you, you, by incorporating lighting quality factors, you can lower, if you lower the, um, the foot candles 50 to 80% below current practice. Current practice says 60 to 100 foot candles in the front row. You can bring that down to 20 foot candles in a heartbeat. There's probably only 20 foot candles out there. You can see and read under five foot candles very easily. Okay. Uh, high color rendering lamps. You can see much color form and shape much better under lamps that have high, high color quality than low color quality. Uh, better uniformity and step switching controls so that when a car lot closes, maybe an hour after they close, 30% of the lights go off. And then maybe at 2 in the morning, another 30% of the lights go off. So it helps dark sky, it saves them a ton of energy, and the return on investment, well, the control systems cost $40,000. Well, you're going to save 15000 a year in energy and maintenance if you put the control systems in. So find the money because it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a lot cheaper to borrow and pay the interest than it is to leave your lights on all night long. It drives me crazy driving around metropolitan areas at 2 in the morning, which I hardly ever do anymore, and see parking lot lights on all night long. It's, it's ludicrous. All, all that money, all the energy. Of course, the power companies are rubbing their hands together. They like that, you know. Um, uh, so and when you do this, you reduce the glare. Not only in the sales lot, but the surrounding neighborhood, you have a huge energy reduction. It provides greater, you can actually see better. You can see the dealership better. The sea of glare is gone. You can read the signs. Uh, and better uh, visibility of product details and re reduced uh, problems outdoors. And this quick story about Temple Bethel. Uh, we, they wanted it illuminated after dark. We did a, a lighting plan. The township said they don't have, they don't allow uplighting on buildings for dark sky reasons, and they don't want complaints from the neighbors. So I, to make a long story short, I went to before the zoning board and I took a copy of the model lighting ordinance, and I said, "This is a 90-foot structure." And out of my pocket, I pulled a light bulb, about this big, and I said, "These are the bulbs that we're using to light this big building. They're not really bright." 
It doesn't take a lot of light. We use 16 35 watt metal halide lamps to light a 90 foot structure. I said, we're not using big fixtures. And they said, they reluctant, they said, well, we'll I'll provide a variance for you on this, but if there's any complaints from the neighbors, you're gonna have to shut the lights off. So sure enough, uh, we, and we, the, the, the prescriptive formula for you doing this was in the model lighting ordinance. The model lighting ordinance allows so many lumens per square foot. That's how the, the formula is, works. We were about 80% below what was allowed as far as lumens per square foot. We did, the, you could shine a flashlight on this at night and see something. So uh, we were way below that. And we went before the board six months later after it was op operating. They, they unanimously approved it, but before they did that, they said, is there any comments from the audience? And somebody got up and I said, uh-oh, who's this guy? And he says, I'm a neighbor and I live behind the temple. And I, uh, we got together and we had a conversation about the new lighting of the temple. And we just wanted to tell you how much we really appreciate. It's beautiful, it's, you know, we love it. It's, and I was like, oh. <laughs> so, Anyway, so the, use the MLO when you're considering outdoor lighting programs. Oops, I got it upside down. I'm almost done. All right, and into the future, uh, I'll hold the question just for a minute. Okay, in the future, light and wellness. The Europeans are way ahead of us on this one. They're 10 years ahead of us on this one. Uh, providing spaces for employees and large corporations to go get their seasonal effective depression taken care of, circadian rhythms adjusted. 70% uh, of the US population is really deficient in vitamin D. There's this big scare about sunlight and skin cancer, which is a whole other conversation I can't get into right now, but uh, uh, this is coming down the road because of rising healthcare costs. And if you can help seasonal effect of depression or increase, increase productivity, people get their vitamin D levels up and all of that, adjust the circadian rhythms using light methods, it's gonna be a huge uh, number in the future. This I threw up here just to point out that the only two organizations that represent independent lighting designers is the ILD and the PLDA, that's the Professional Lighting Designers Association. All of the rest, the National Lighting Bureau is a great place for case studies that support all of this stuff I've just been talking about. Um, but the IES is, is mostly a manufacturers and suppliers organization, and the LC uh, it has nothing to do with qualifications for lighting design. It's a technical exam that somebody can take if you study hard enough, but you don't have to have any experience in this other stuff I talked about. You just have to know about lamps and ballasts and how things work together and energy loads and things like that. Um, there is all of the websites to support all the stuff I've been talking about. And I wanna thank you very much for having me here. It's we have 10 minutes uh, for questions and for all the attendees, uh, uh, make sure that you sign in uh, for the presentation and uh, uh, I also want to make sure that you have filled in the evaluation forms. Yes, ma'am, you have to have well, questions. Well, I should just kind of comment on additional piece of information. But in major cities across the United States and also in Canada, um, Audubon Group is trying to um, impress upon architects and building owners that it's really great to have been very it's a big, a big improvement to turn off the lights during migratory season, uh -huh. particularly from the fifth floor up. And because small birds migrate at nighttime, that's when so many accidents occur. They either circle the building and fall exhausted, they run into the building. So it's real. We're talking about trying to improve the night sky. That's one of the things that will help is if you get the lights off and light yeah. trace. Yeah, that's a good point. I've been involved in a couple of projects that where that's been brought up, and with today's technology, it's very easy to light the building beautifully from, let's say, sunset to 10 or 11 at night, and then dim the lights to 50% at until midnight, and then shut them off on different stages and things like that. So, but it is a, something that people have to need to be aware of. Here it's called Safe Passages, and Ford Motor Company is one that is supplied as well as some other tall buildings in the right. country. Good point. Thanks. Yes, sir. Uh, you spoke about you know some of the challenges with LEDs. 
Um, I didn't hear you say anything about challenges with CFLs or with fluorescence overall, but there are a number of issues that people raise about those. And so I was wondering if you could talk about those. Yeah, uh, CFLs, there's two types. One that goes into a lamp or a fixture that's designed for it, and the other is the screw-in type. Okay, the screw-in type CFL uses a lot more energy to manufacture and ship over here than it actually saves. They're not really good for residential applications necessarily because in residential lighting, in a commercial building, you're operating your lighting 10, 12, 14 hours a day. And in residential lighting, how long do you run your lights in your bedroom or your whatever? Uh, every little bit helps, but ideally you would have a fixture and a lamp and a ballast that were designed together. CFLs have a little bit of mercury in them. That's important. And, and fluorescent lamps should be disposed of as hazardous waste. This is, again, something to be brought up with the owner early in the design. Like with this tech center we're doing, I said, how do you do your lighting maintenance? Do you do it internally? How do you dispose of your lamps? Did you know that it's, you, know, you should be disposing them? So it's, it's creating this awareness that's important. Um, other than that, uh, the technology still is pretty advanced. You get pretty good color. The problem with fluorescent lighting, like other lighting, is that when it's off, it all looks the same. So if you're doing something, a renovation or an upgrade, you should try different color lamps because, boy, there's a, there's a, a rainbow of colors available. And uh, there's been a lot of problems with people putting in compact fluorescent lamps and going, oh, the light's so blue, you know, it's terrible, I'm never gonna do this again. And did I sound like Bill Clinton? I don't know. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> sorry. So, um, you need to do a mock-up when it comes to retrofitting lamps like that. Does that help answer your question? It does, can, can I just follow up? Yeah. Just two, two things. The state of California is really trying to get rid of fluorescence as much as they can. And part of the reason is, is because of the waste issue that really costs municipalities. So that's just, I think, something that needs to be mentioned. You say it's a hazardous waste, which is true, but most people don't properly handle the disposal of those CFLs. Yeah. And the other thing is, in building after building, if I talk to a maintenance person, it's really <coughs> the maintenance person will tell them, tell me that a CFL in a can will last longer than one year. And what most people don't realize is how much the light gets cut, 50% in some cases, by having it going up. And the other issue is cycle time. You know, cycle yeah. time needs to be at least 10 minutes or you lose another 50%. Right. So those are some of the things people want to talk about. So people use these CFLs, they expect that life you're talking about. Mm -hmm. They don't get it. Uh, there may be challenges with some of the LEDs, but from a hazardous waste and a municipality cost issue, it's a whole, you know, yeah. other. So I, I just wanted to. Just yeah, there's a. Yeah, there, it's very. It's it is complicated. It's more complicated than people really understand. And so, yes, sir. A uh, couple of questions. Um, what do you prefer for the uh, parking lot lights? Car dealerships, probably induction. Uh, I think for outdoor applications, LED is a really good option. You get really good controlled optics. So you can get really good color rendering. Uh, long life, good energy uh, for a new installation. If it was a renovation, I might look at some other sources. I've seen some fluorescent lit sales lot that look pretty darn good down south. Uh, but I, th I think the point is it's important to take a look at the needs and the budget and the initial costs and the long-term costs and the quality of light and, and then kind of select a source that way. I, I, for a renovation, or new construction, I probably wouldn't go with recommend metal halide. Again, uh, unless the budget is, a, is an issue. It, so. uh, you showed the uh, picture of Skylight with a uh, solar tractor mirror. Oh, yeah. Have you followed that technology? Is that how uh, is it? it? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a little gimmicky. I, we, we don't believe in our office that it, it has a substantial benefit over uh, skylights that have good reflectors in them and lensing systems and things like that. You have movable parts that, you know, come into play and they break and so. But I put it up there so because I don't think people have seen that before. So <laughs> not something that we're recommending. It's just was some eye candy. So. 
Any other questions? Oh, yes, uh, Dave. Uh, Stefan, uh, what do you, uh, I, I, really, um, I really like the, uh, the, the mindset where perception is a big, is a big issue with lighting. Uh, and it's hard to measure it. But how do, you, how do you see the professionals that are coming out? A lot of lighting is done by electrical engineers. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, from my experience has been is they they followed certain standards, you know, the luminance and all that kind of stuff, where it's formula driven. Right. And perception doesn't seem to get somehow into the equation. How do you see the teaching of lighting in that in that in, in for electrical engineers, how do you see has any of that changed? Or is it up to the architect and the, the lighting specialist to to uh, force the issue uh, with people who are developing power requirements for buildings and all that? Yeah. Uh, continuing education is critical. Uh, the technology is moving so quickly. If you're not attending an international lighting conference once a year, you're, you're way behind the curve. I, when I go to these conferences, I do see a lot of electrical engineers, many from Detroit, a handful or so that I recognize, or maybe more. But not, it's probably about 2% or 1% or 2%. And I don't see very many architects at lighting conferences learning about this stuff. So that's where bringing in some expertise, outside expertise can be really beneficial to the owner. Now the problem with that is, well, we don't have a fee for, in our budget, for outside consulting, for landscaping or for lighting or for whatever, audio, video or whatever. Um, so, but if the owner knew about the return on investment in doing things better, lighting is, is probably the most dominant technology that shows the highest return on investment than any other technology in buildings. And it's such a low initial cost. It's only three to 5% of the construction costs. And the fees to design it to have that expertise is only 10% of that. So, you know, it's a, it, it's, it's a problem. And it really just comes around to awareness. Before I forget, too, by the way, I've got up here some unbranded bro brochures we made about 12 years ago called Advocates of Lighting Quality if you want to take one with you. So, but did that, did that answer your question? Okay. So spread the word. <laughs> uh, yes, ma'am. So what is the best type of lighting? I still don't know for housing. I mean, for CFL, there's something wrong with that. And then LED, that has issues. For homes, yeah. For new construction, daylight integration. For renovations, you can get good quality systems from LED and from compact fluorescent, but they have, it requires some uh, time looking at these different sources and learning about them. And so, you know, buying, you know, talking to some people, most of the time the folks at the light, if you go to an electric shop, you might have find some, you wanna walk into an electric supply place and say, I wanna, I wanna talk to your lighting expert who's been here the longest. And, then, and take some pictures of your home and say, I want to replace the lighting in these table lamps and I want to replace the lighting in these down lights. What do you recommend? And then go to another store and ask the same question and see if you get the same answer. And then once you're satisfied, you're getting some consistency, buy one of each of these and take them home and put them in and see how they look. Nothing is gonna look like the same as incandescent but you'll get close and it'll be, it'll be worth the effort to go through that exercise. Because if you go out and just buy a bunch of bulbs and change them, uh, you may be really disappointed and spend a lot of money in the process. So you have to be an informed consumer. And mock-ups, I mentioned earlier, light's invisible. So how do you describe what it's gonna look like? You can't even take a picture of it because it's so three-dimensional. And the best way to tell if you like the color of light is with your skin tones. You kind of grew up with your hands. And if you put it underneath the light source and your skin looks natural, then maybe that's a pretty good source to work with. But if it looks blue or green, maybe you want to try something else. <laughs> yes? I know I went through that process. Uh, I spent a lot of time working out what CFL looked best in which room 
and just a, I mean, it's really important to think about your task too. Like in the kitchen, you may want something very bright and light, and then in other areas, you might want blue. So I would highly recommend, like you said, taking home one of each and trying in different yep. corners and spaces in your house. It takes time to about once you cut it down, write yep. it down. Yeah. Uh, on our website, uh, we have a paper about residential lighting, and um, there may be some information in there. You can just print that out. That might be helpful. It, it, it asks you to think about task lighting, ambient lighting, accent lighting, security lighting, you know, all these different systems that have to work together. The one thing about the compact fluorescent lamps is you can't get a spotlight using a compact fluorescent bulb. If you want to create drama and spotlight a table or hi highlight some art, you have to, and you want a new technology, you have to use uh, LED or, or halogen. Again, oh, the other thing about halogen lighting, now they're, 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 they're uh, eliminating the incandescent lamps, but they're still gonna come out with an incandescent shaped bulb with a halogen filament inside. So you'll still be able to get that dimmable, warm technology. The halogen filament's gonna cost you more, it's gonna last longer. But if you put all your lights in your house on a dimmer, if you dim it just 5%, it quadruples the lamp life. How many have dimmers in their homes? Have you, have you noticed how long the bulbs last on the circuits with dimmers versus switches? The other thing is with dimmers, you can dramatically increase your energy. You may, may be more energy efficient just to put dimmers on and everything and continue to use incandescent or halogen sources, unless you're running your lights 14 hours a day. So, anybody else? I'll be around for at least an hour or so after this if you haven't, yes sir. I wonder if you had any experience with, uh, at least from retrofitting more efficient lighting for and historic church sanctuaries also to brighten the light a little bit because yeah. uh, you know, we all remember saying that you know, it's damn hard to... We've got a lot of churches and, and, yeah. and so forth. Yep. Uh, Houses of worship in general and, and a lot of time it's just changing the lamps. Uh, sometimes it involves, if you light the perimeter walls if they're not already lit or if you do some uplighting on the ceiling. The, a couple of houses of worship we've done lighting in, we improve the efficiency of lighting in the pews, but we added some light on the walls and on the ceiling, and people walk in and go, oh my gosh, it's twice as bright in here, this is wonderful. But the foot candles were the same as it was before. But it feels brighter. And so the uplighting on the ceiling, revealing, a lot of churches have beautiful architecture, and it kind of disappears. You're sitting there and you're, you know, everything's down here, but if you light up that architecture overhead, not only does it reveal it and make it beautiful, but it also increases the perception of brightness. Oh. Is that it? Okay, we're done. <laughs> Thanks very much.